Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce John Milroy uh, as our lecturer today. Uh, John is a fellow of the Society, a recipient of the Science Award, and also a recipient of the Honorary uh, Member Award for the NSS, the highest, one of the highest honors that we offer in that. Um, many of you know John, his uh, uh, formerly at Murray State University and also at Mississippi State University with a very, very distinguished career in, um, in cave and car science. So uh, with no further delay, I want to introduce John and I'm going to put a mic on him and then we're going to go right to his lecture. Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, the title pretty much says what it, what it means. Uh, I was looking in life for a way to get paid to go caving. And so I uh, tried, uh, thought about a number of different ways to do it, but this is the way. Now, for those of you in the audience who don't know it, uh, the phonetic pronunciation of my name is uh, Milroy. Okay? All right. So, 1974, uh, Joan and I uh, discovered Caboose Cave in Cary County, New York, and it sort of set the tone for how I approached cave, my caving, which was to use science to see if I could find more caves. We found this one by uh, sort of predicting where it should be, going there and finding it was there. And so that was uh, a first step in what we we're going to do. But people have been asking me for years, family, students, colleagues, uh, basically, uh, how did I go from uh, to be a college professor doing cave research? How's that sweet little boy? end up in a hole in the ground. Well, basically, life's a series of choices. And on the hydro field trip Sunday, we were talking about did we regret anything and uh, what we would have done different and all that sort of stuff. And I had been thinking about that and I had already put this talk together, but I thought it played well. Uh, where we get depends on the decisions we make, but a lot of decisions are made for us. And so we have to deal with that. Uh, you can make good decisions, okay, and you can have end up with money and family, or you can make some bad decisions, and you can end up like on the far left with, uh, hold my beer and watch this, and then so you never know where you're going to end up. So what controls where you're going to get and how you're going to get there? Well, there are internal decisions of what you control. So you control some things about your personal life and all this sort of stuff, and you may think you're under control. But actually, uh, you know, there's peer pressure, there's government, teachers, parents, church, all that. I should have put another arrow in. I should have put an arrow in for QAnon. Because <laughs> they know everything and they're in control of everything. But those are the external decisions. So how the heck do you get around that? So that's the question. What happened to me? Clark's okay, they're upstate New York. So, I appeared in the world on the 14th of June, 1949. There's my dad holding me and there's me again at the bottom. And then also at the bottom you see the arrows pointing towards sisters. Both were older than me. And then when I was 10, my mother decided to surprise me and gave me another sister. So I was bracketed. Now, so what were they like? Well, the oldest one, Kathleen, she was the brains. And the next oldest one, Sarah, she was the muscle. And I came home from school one day, it was first grade, and they slapped me down on the kitchen floor, and Sarah held me in place and pulled down my pants, and my little buns were exposed, and my oldest sister opened up the oven door where I could see it with my head flat to the floor and pulled the pizza pan out from under the broiler passed it over my face, put it behind me and set it on a trivet, took one from the freezer, touched it to my buttons. And inside my head, something went crack. And I've never really been the same. Now you would ask, why would my sisters do that to me? Because I'd go up to them and say, I'm mommy's favorite boy, but you're not her favorite girl. And they would run into my mother and they'd go, Mommy, Mommy, am I your favorite daughter? And she'd say, I love all my daughters equally. And I'd turn to my sister and say, see? <laughs> so there was some give and take. Well, coming back, that June 14th, 1949, led to a story my mother used to say all the time. 
that I had been born on Flag Day. And then, turns out I wasn't. The state of Pennsylvania recorded all birth dates on standard time because daylight savings time had been a World War II energy conservation measure. And everybody thought there, we would revert eventually back to it. So, my birth date became June 13th. <laughs> you think that's a laugh? Well, who cares about that, right? This will become important, as we will see later on. And I had nothing to do with it. That was an external decision. So anyhow, we moved a lot when I was a kid. I was born in Philadelphia, and I grew up initially in a little town called Coltsville, which some of you may know where it is, outside Lansdale, Norristown. And uh, we were going to move to, move to Detroit. And my father had gotten the house sold, and the guy had driven up in his car, and he had the papers on his hood, and he has the pen in his hand, and he's about to sign them, and the State Department of Transportation vehicle pulls up, a guy gets out, and he starts hammering little stakes with flagging tape on them in the front lawn. And the guy looks over and says, what's that all about? Oh, Pennsylvania Turnpike's put an exit in here. And the guy says, I'm not buying this house. He leaves. So my father got to claim an eminent domain decision and got almost twice for the house. Uh-huh. So there, you know, timing is also important. So anyhow, whoops. so we moved. We moved to Gross Point, suburbia, sidewalks, good TV station, lots of friends. Go down to what was then Briggs Stadium and watch the Tigers play. Got to meet Al Kaline, Hall of Famer, 399 home runs. Parties, that's my fifth birthday party. Really great, you know, it was kind of fun. And then in the summer of 1956, 56, we did a family vacation all the way to California. And I got to go to my first cave, Merrimack Caverns. And we got in there and they uh, go to that part of the tour where they turn all the lights off. And I'm sitting next to my sister Sarah and she goes, I'm scared. And I wasn't. And ever after that, I had the dominance position. That was kind of nice. So I liked caving. Caving early on gave me something. And we went on out to Arizona, saw the Grand Canyon, went to California. My uncle, great uncle, had been a cameraman for RKO. I got to go to a sound stage, went to Disney World, Disneyland, it opened only a year, up the craters of the moon, and I got to do a lava tube. So right in the same year, I saw Karst and Zero Karst. <coughs> and then we moved to West Glenville, New York. Oh, yeah, well, uh, Hardly any friends, uh, a couple stations when the sun shone and uh, stuff like that. The bus took a different route to school in the afternoons, so it was uphill both ways. And the only kid I could play with was two years older than me and a year behind me in school. <laughs> you can hear the banjo, folks. But we used to, uh, we played chess. And if I played with just the pawns, it was a 50-50 game. So anyhow. Our zip code, when they, came, they finally came out in the early 60s, was uh, to Amsterdam and the county to the west, but our phone exchange was in Schenectady, which was the county to the east, and uh, no one could find us. And it's bad enough being isolated, but knowing that no one else even knows where you are can be somewhat uh, confusing. But I did get the scene of the cave. I got to go to Howe Caverns in the summer of 59, uh, and I was really intrigued. By that time, I'd been reading um, some early of the cave, popular cave books about caving and uh, I got home and I turned the furniture upside down in the living room and got out sheets and blankets and pillows and cushions and made a cave and crawled through all afternoon until my father came home and told mom to adjust drug medicine. <laughs> so in that sort of a situation I read a lot because there wasn't much else to do. You can only play chess with pawns for so long. So, I got into science fiction reading. Uh, in Columbia County, New York, which was where Merlin's Cave is, which is an NCC, uh, Northeastern Cave Conservancy run cave, there was a town called Chatham. My grandmother lived out there, and they had a little news store, and I'd go in there to read comic books. And one day I saw this analog, science fact, science fiction, The Prophet of Doom by Frank Herbert, and that cover just grabbed me. 
The cover was done by a guy named John Schoenherr, uh, who uh, Frank Herbert said, based on the cover, he was the only man who'd ever visited Doom. Okay. Well, why do I bring up John Schoen here? Because he was a caver. See, it was destiny. And he had done diagrams for various Northeastern regional organization uh, guidebooks, like the one for Gage Caverns and Spider Cave, and he'd done one for Mitchell's Cave. And so already I was connected to caves, and I was really interested in seeing if I could follow that up. Well, high school. So I went to a cave called Hale's Cave in Thatcher Park, New York, and did that on my own and wandered in for about 150 feet, which you could do with just daylight. And I thought, boy, I'd really like to do more of this. But when you get to high school, you get to play sports. And one of the things that made me a good caver was I was small and skinny, which meant I wasn't playing football. So I played soccer. Now there I am. Oof. And also there were girls. This was a phenomenon to me. There was something else out there besides sisters, you know, who, who didn't beat you up all the time. So I got, you know, to go out, started dating, meeting, meeting nice girls, even ended up between two girls in my yearbook. Of course, nobody asked them, but you know, that's just the way it goes. And in biology club, uh, because of biology club, I decided to take advanced placement biology. There were only two advanced placement courses offered in my high school at the time. It was calculus, and who the hell wants to do that? Or advanced placement biology. And you'll notice that I'm in the top row, row with the only girl in the top row. This is significant. I like smart women who take the place they want. They don't ask permission. Right, Joan? <laughs> okay. Flash the pointer, show them your content. Okay, there you go. All right, so comes the summer of, uh, fall of 1966 for the 1967 college admissions year, and I've, I'm going to be going to college, at least that's what my parents tell me, and I decided, what the heck, I'll apply to two schools. 1967, at that time, was the largest number of male applicants for college in the history of the country because the war was on in Vietnam, and you could get the 2S student deferment if you went to college. So I only applied two places, which indicates either tremendous confidence or stupidity. So uh, Amherst rejected me, which I figured would happen. But Bowden appeared to accept me, and then through a clerical error, rejected me. This is that stupid name I have. I began to get duplicate mailings. One spelled the right way, and one spelled my broid, with a B and a D in it. I go, what the hell? And so I packaged all those up and wrote a little cover letter saying I think these were in error and sent it back, and they must have gotten pissed off because then they rejected me. This is after I'd gotten a letter from the soccer coach telling when to report for practice, and Bowdoin College houses this population, 90% in fraternities, and I had all these letters from fraternities and all this sort of stuff, and all of a sudden, it's April 1, all my buddies got all these letters are where they're going, and I'm going nowhere. So I had a friend named Jim Shook, and his mother was a substitute teacher in the high school, and she could teach anything, English, history, math. She'd show up and was just like the teacher was there. And she said, apply to Syracuse University late admissions program. I go, OK. So I applied. I got accepted. My parents were jubilant because I had a New York State Region Scholarship, but it was only good in the state of New York. And since Syracuse was 103 miles away from Amsterdam, New York, more than 100 miles meant I was no longer had to be on their car insurance as a routine driver. As an 18-year-old teenager, you can understand why that was important. So um, just after Labor Day in fall of 67, I go to Syracuse, and it's like the picture they show there. It's a beautiful day. And the first thing they do when you arrive is they gave you your beanie. You had to wear a beanie, okay? It was like a plebe at the academy, you know? And you had to have, say your little ditty any time an upperclassman asked you to. For my class, it was, we're the class of 7-1. We're the class that's second to none. And if you didn't say it, then they beat you. So I'm looking at all this, and that's a beautiful sunny day, and I say, I'm gonna love it here. And this upperclassman is helping us load 
our stuff into our dorm room, grabs my shirt, and goes, listen, shithead, there's 10 sunny days a year in Syracuse, and this is number nine. <laughs> and he was right. It, in North America, it's the cloudiest city in November and December, has only one day in four that has any sun. So I was already caving, I hadn't gone underground yet. All right. Well, I'll go to, go to Syracuse, I got to play soccer. I got to play on the club team. They didn't have a varsity team. You had to sort of interview. And they said, well, why should we put you on the team? I said, oh, in high school. I was the leading scorer my senior year. What I didn't tell them, we played 12 games, scored three goals, and I got two of them. But I didn't lie to them. I was such a bad player that when good players got next to me, they got bad too. <laughs> so the coach always put me on whoever the other team's best player was or playmaker was, and I would hound them all day long. And at Cornell, with four minutes to go in the game, one guy came up behind me and rabbit punched me, and I woke up in the ambulance. So there's, you know, payback. You know, you have to be careful about that. But my senior year, uh, we had petitioned the university, and my senior year, I got to play varsity soccer uh, for Syracuse University, which was kind of interesting. Doing a away game at West Point, walk out on that beautiful campus and have your midday meal and sit with all those freshmen eating their soup in unison with the spoon like this. Everybody up and down the table. I'm thinking, I really don't want to go in the army. <laughs> but the other thing college has, cute girls, and you know what's best? Their mommy and daddy aren't around. <laughs> so she was uh, an upperclassman. She was a sophomore. It was uh, January of 68, and me and my buddy are going to chem lecture. And the reason I'm going to chem lecture as a freshman is I'd had AP biology, so I didn't have to take biology my freshman year, which I didn't have to do. So I'm out looking for two seats next to each other in the auditorium. There's two seats next to this blonde. So I stroll out there and I said, do you mind if I sit here? She looked up at me and said, I was saving this seat for a good looking guy. <laughs> and, and I said, I've got the homework done. And she said, you can stay. So that's, that's, that's when I realized that I had to trade in something. If it wasn't looks, it was going to be intellect or something. So anyhow, so we got started to hang out. And, uh, because of that, you know, she was a sophomore, I was a freshman, I was time equivalent with her in the uh, registration or advising schedule for classes, so we were a lot of class together. So earlier decisions were starting to make an impact, and I started doing a lot more caving. In the, uh, the previous summer of 67, I had been dating this girl, and she had a little brother who loved caves, and he just kept talking about caves, and we should go in a cave. All he wanted to do was make out with his sister, but he convinced me. So I went to a Nescathaw cave in the summer of 67 with him, had a wonderful time, had a wonderful time, came back and convinced some people I uh, knew of in Syracuse in the fall of 68 to go back, let's go. I think Art, this is when you were remapping it. Where is Art? He's in here someplace. Yeah, you and Peg were mapping it then, right? Yeah, so I didn't even know that. So you can see what it's like to go caving in 1968. You got helmet liners on, one guy's confused about his orientation. Somebody's got up written on it, so Bruce and Kathy and Ron are there and I'm there. And of course, the person, the photo photographer is this person named Joan Saxon, because that's her maiden name. I know nothing more about that. Anyhow, so I got really into caving for the outing club. Now, if you cave in New York, it can be over pretty quickly. Uh, you know, at the uh, 91 NSS convention in Cobalt Skill, Art Palmer gave the banquet speech. He made an interesting statement. He had a map at Diddley Cave up there, which was a simple little tiny cave, which has since gotten very big. But he says, you have to love the little ones to be a true caver. Anybody can be turned on by Lecce Gee or a Wind Cave or a Mammoth Cave, but do you love the little ones? So, in New York, there's a lot of little ones, so there's a lot of love. I want you to know. You really gotta, you gotta really have a good time there. Uh, Ernest Casting once said, if you laid all the caves in New York end to end, they'd be low, wet, muddy, and sparse in formations. <laughs> Pretty
pretty accurate. So, but all that book reading I had done back in uh, West Glenville, New York, paid off because I got good grades and I got summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa, and I thought that's good. Maybe, maybe I got something going here. It really helped that the girl I was dating was also Phi Beta Kappa. Okay, so good to have some smarts. So I'm thinking about what are my options here? You know, I'm going to get a degree. She's getting a degree. You know, maybe I could make an important inter internal decision. And uh, that doesn't really matter what she made. What mattered was the decision she made, which was, okay, sucker, let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, Monday was our 52nd wedding anniversary, just so you know. Well, all this is going on. You know, I went to college in the fall of 67 saying, boy, that Vietnam War is going to be over by the time I graduate. Well, no, it wasn't. And in 1970, because there were so many complaints about these people got deferments because they were married with children, or they were married, or they had, they were in a master's program. So they got rid of all those deferments, and they went to a lottery. Wow. You can already tell where this is going, can't you? Yeah. June 13th came up as 69. Wow. Sitting on this, I was watching this on TV in Marshall Cottage, which was a, a woman's house on campus, a uh, residential house, and sitting to my right was Craig Wilson. He drew 71. He was a journalist. He, he, he ended up writing a column for USA Today for about 25 years. On my left was Bob Corley, he got 131. We all knew we were going. So, June 14th, guess what that number came up as? 346. Thanks, Mom. You know, could have held your knees together for another 35 minutes. And, and I would have been okay. But she did feel bad about it. You know, there's Pennsylvania birth record. Boom, an external decision, a consequence. Who would have thought? So my mom says, oh, well, I know who your, the intern was who delivered you. I'll, I'll write him a letter and get him to sign an affidavit saying you were born on June 14th local time. He declined to do so, but politely. C. Everett Coop, the Surgeon General under Ronald Reagan, was a guy who delivered me in 1949 and also would not sign the letter. He said, he said, I said he politely, he wrote back and said, I think every young man should serve his country. Whew, hard, to, hard to argue with that, so. Anyhow, what does that all mean? It means you're not going to grad school and you can't get a job. And I've already gotten my AFES letter to go for my armed forces physical. Well, that's another story. Get me drunk, I'll tell you about that. So it was into the Naval Reserve for me. Now, yeah, be careful there. He might jump up the picture at you. The, um, there's been some politicians who escaped going to Vietnam by different routes. One guy sank, sank as low as to become a Rhodes Scholar and go to, go to Great Britain. Uh, other two other people we know of uh, got, in the, got in the National Guard. I can guarantee you, you could not get in the National Guard unless you new people who do people. But there were two naval reserve spots still open in the Northeast United States because you had to pass a high school science test to get in, corpsman and sonar technician. And the guy, I passed the test and the recruiter says, well, what do you want to be? Well, I'm getting a degree in zoology. I should be a corpsman. He says, great. You'll train with the Marines at Camp Lejeune. <laughs> I, said, I said, you didn't hear me. I said, sonar technician. And they sent me to Key West, Florida for my uh, active duty portion of my training. So, so I get out in February of uh, 72 and I've done my active duty and I'm looking around, what am I gonna do? And there was a guy at Albany State University who was mapping zooplankton and phytoplankton on Lake Ontario with sonar. And he, 
I wrote him and he said, I told him I've been trained by the Navy in sonar and I got a degree in biology. So I ended up working in this electronic laboratory for a while. And that had the, but in the meantime, Joan is working for General Electric Research and Development where she would help earn a patent on the second organism ever patented in this country. I always made me nervous when I was eating dinner. What's in here? How's it going to change me? Recombinant DNA. So, so a consequence of the state of Pennsylvania, Syracuse University, draft boards making external decisions and trying to work within that framework to make internal decisions. And caving had become just all encompassing passion. I just was totally bought into it. And the important thing about these three slides is that in the left, I'm standing. But in New York, you crawl. Okay, just, just so we're good on that. But I was really into it. And fortunately for me, so is John. And uh, here we are in Blue Spring Cave with uh, photography by art. So we went caving all over the place. Um, now some of these may look strange. I mean, what the heck am I doing in Bermuda? What's, what's Joan doing in Bermuda? Well, that was in the government quarry. And they had been making the parking lot or the main drag through had breached a cave from above. So they slapped a piece of steel on it and said, oh, you can go in and lunch hour when we're not driving the trucks. So we skinned the thing out. You can see all the oily water dripping into there. So we decided to go electric and no carbide. And then, for those of you who've been to the Little Neath River Valley, what cave is that? It's obvious. It's White Lady Cave. It's got a White Lady in it. That's the actual name for a calcite formation in the back. Never mind. All right. Up in California, we went up there in 1978, and they, we'd gone to Lilburn and had a great time there. Stan Ufeld took us around. And we were going to go hike up to Mineral King. And we said, where do we find the cave Mineral King? I said, oh, there's been a lot of snow this year. Just look for the blowholes in the snow. That'll be where the cave entrances are. So we hike up, and we're setting up camp, and I decide to take a quick pre-scout so of what we're going to do the next day. So I'm there walk out into this big snow field, and I see this hole in it. I go, wow, must be a cave there. And I walk out. And I look down, I'm on top of a 50 foot deep, 20 foot diameter pit, and I'm on the snow bridge. <laughs> and I remembered as a kid, all that reading I did, a Jack London story, where if you're on a snow bridge over a crevasse, you step back in your existing footprints. You don't make new ones. So I did that, got back where it was safe, what the British call a brown trouser job, and got back. Well, the next day, we're right where Joe was sitting in that picture. We go down that passage, explore some caves, a little bit of a crawl to the right. We go through, we pop up in this dome pit. And there in the top is this beautiful blue scene you get when you see light coming through ice or snow with this beautiful, brilliant white circle in the middle and white footprints. I was probably one candy bar away from being too heavy to have survived that. So, you get the cave, you have some neat war stories you get to tell. So, Art Palmer, boy, you've already seen, he's shot a lot of photographs and stuff like this. Um, how do you and be a caver and do it with caving? Well, I could see Bob and Bob and later Emily trying to make a living selling cavers stuff. But you come to a meeting like this and you're not here, you're over trying to sell stuff and everybody's here so you're not selling any. Anyhow, or you could own a cave and have a tourist cave. Too much like work. <laughs> but I looked at Art and I said, he's on a nine month academic contract. He gets his summers off and he goes caving around the world. He goes to England, he goes to Yugoslavia. Oh boy, that's pretty good. But the best part was, in the winter, they paid him. He got paid to bullshit to students. And I said, I can do that. I know I can do that. So I have been thinking about this for some time. Uh, and so I've been started to hang out with Art, because you want some of that success to rub off on you. So here we are in Bermuda, 1974. And there's a late Mike Queen. And uh, my students would ask, what's this picture in here for? Oh. I could tell them that's a 10-point buck I got last time I was out hunting. 
No, you can. You can. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's a ten pointer, right? No. What it is, is that uh, a landowner had enlarged his garden and cut into the side of the hill with a bulldozer to make a larger garden and opened up a cave. And he didn't want a cave, so he had cinder blocked it shut. And Mike, Mike, Mike knew where this cave was. We came out, we talked to the owner, he says, well, you can go in, but you can only take out one cinder block. <laughs> well, that's nine inches by 18 inches, and a real caver can get in there. So we took out the one cinder block and we inserted Mike. And I would tell my students that there were six people off screen to the left with a telephone pole ramming them in there. But really we fit in quite well as one little cave and that was all it took. And then one thing I taught Joan was how to pose for photographs. I had some colleagues, I get them in a photograph and they pose and they look like real dork, you know? But Joan had a real talent for that. And this is the first time I realized how geology could really uh, Help, help me get, get along. So, when I just get now the Navy, I thought, boy, I should go get a PhD. And I'd heard there's this new guy in, in McMaster University named Derek Ford, a Brit, escaping to the uh, Americas. And uh, maybe I could go there for grad school. Because uh, Art Palmer at SUNY, SUNY Oneana didn't have a PhD program, only had a master's degree. So, I wrote him and he writes back this nice and polite letter saying, really kid, you can't come here. You don't know any geology. You don't know any geography. You're an American and because of all the draft dodgers, we can't give you any support. They changed the rules up here. But he said, good luck. And uh, we went to a conference in 2015 in uh, Great Britain that, that Derek attended. And I had to give a talk. In the talk, I popped this up and I said, Derek, do you even remember this letter? And he had no memory of it at all. Of course not, because you get Mentors. It was, you know, decades before, but that was uh, good fun. However, I talked my way in at RPI. Uh, I'd already tried to talk my way out of RPI. That was Rice Paddy Institute. But this is the RPI I wanted to get into, and uh, it was a, a faculty member named Bob LaFleur, and he'd had a grad student named Victor Baker, who had done a car thing for his master's degree. Vic went on to become one of the most famous geomorphologists in North America, famous for his work on the scab lands and the flood, mega floods in the Northwest and all history of geology and all sorts of stuff. And so Lafleur was willing to take chance on a student who would uh, do cave and car studies, especially since nobody was going to give me any money. I couldn't teach anything. I didn't know anything. I couldn't be a research assistant, but I did have the Joan Milroy Memorial Scholarship. In other words, Joan's paycheck. So I paid private school tuition to go to grad school at RPI. And in May of 1977, my six-year obligation in the United States is over. I don't have to drill anymore. I have to go, to, go on two weeks active duty. I don't have to do all that sort of stuff. And uh, so I get my discharge. And you know what? They couldn't even spell my name right on my discharge. That's 45 years ago. I could still be in the Navy. In which case, they owe me a lot of back pay, or I've been AWOL for 45 years, and me and Leavenworth are going to get into that. So I don't know. Anyhow, I was done with that. And in June, I got my PhD. And I was really happier to have my honorable discharge because it meant they were taking women and children before they got my ass again, you know? Anyhow, got my PhD, got it published as Bolton II in the Ernst Cave Survey. Now, Ernst cast me to publish his master's degree as Bolton I and, and a press run of 200. Already got his PhD at Indiana done a press run of 200. They both sold out in a few years. I go, well, wasn't that silly? I'll do a press run of 500. And in two years, I sold 200. And it took 30 years to sell the next 300. <laughs> As you guys in caves and cars know that you can sell 200 anything to cavers, but beyond that it gets tough. But this meant I had to get a job, you know? And so, sort of a little eerie talk about destiny. I had a subscription to GeoTimes magazine. You can see down at the bottom actually it had my name spelled right. And here comes this issue for October of uh, 76, and it's got epicarst on it. It's got all the solutional landforms on it. 
God, that's destiny. I look in. Murray State University in Kentucky, Allegheny College in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. I'm looking for people who might be up my line. I actually applied to a third college, uh, Denison, Pennsylvania. But I actually got an interview opportunity at both two schools. I thought, oh boy, Allegheny is much more prestigious than Murray State. But Murray State's sort of like Oneana State. It's a former teacher's college. And they, maybe they don't care that I do karst research. Because if, if you did karst research in 1977, you were a spelunker. You know? So, well, everybody's been complaining for the last couple months about how much gas costs and five dollars a gallon really sucks. You pay five dollars a gallon if the alternative is to not have any gas at all. And those of you who remember the 76, 77 time frame and there was lining up and all that sort of stuff and trying to get gasoline. Well, Allegheny College decided to extend their semester break all the way to the end of January so that they could uh, save some energy uh, money on energy costs. So Murray State had me come down, but Allegheny College didn't. Sort of interesting. Many years later, I'm at a Barry Beck sinkhole conference in Florida, and we have an overnight field trip, so we have to have a night out in the field in a motel. And the guy who gets assigned to share the room with me is the guy who got the Allegheny job. He was from Penn State. Remember who it was, Will? So, so I go down to Murray State. When I say, okay, I'll come for an interview, they say, well, we can't pay for it, but can you bring your wife? I go, really? I said, well, you know, unless you see the place, it's hard to make a decision about coming down here. So we coughed up the extra money. Joan flew down with me. So I make applications, Allegheny defaults. Murray makes an offer, so we decide to go south. Murray State was one of those places where, where you're meeting with a young faculty the first year and they're saying, and the, and the spouse is saying, oh, what if he doesn't get tenure? By year two, they're going, God, what if he gets tenure? You know, he'll be there forever. But now I got to do caving as research. Mike Dias had set up the Western Kentucky Speleological Survey, and he and I, and Preston and Sherry Forsyth out there in the audience someplace, we did a lot of caving in West Kentucky, and I published all these sort of guidebooks, and I'd learned my lesson. It was a 200 press run, okay? And uh, so one day I'm in my office, and I get a phone call. It's the president's secretary. Could you come see Dr. Curtis this afternoon? I said, about what? Your research. Oh. One of my papers must have been important. So I go over and I get in his office, I sit down in front of him. He's got one of these in front of him. He's got it open. To Hardy Cave. And I say, uh, yes, sir. He goes, well, you're responsible for this map. Actually, it wasn't. I hadn't made the map, but I had published it. I said, yeah, yes, sir. He goes, OK. Well, this is on a farmer's land. And when I-24 was built from Paducah to Nashville, they bisected his property. And his pasture land on the far side of I-24 doesn't have any water. So he used your map and he drilled into the terminal pool in the cave. Now he has lots of water and he's real happy. I went, okay, you know, so what? His brother's Speaker of the House in the state legislature. Oh man, understand, Murray State University is 120 miles west of a school called Western Kentucky. Okay, so talk about being out in the middle of nowhere. So anyhow, we did this, ran around. Survey 95 kilometers of cave in 10 years in sinkhole plain because nobody wanted to go there. It could go to Mammoth or the bigger systems to the east. So it was really a great, great fun time. And at the same time, I go to Murray State. A guy I worked with, a young faculty member at RPI named James Leslie Acaru, a Jimmy boy, and I started running a fuel program to a fuel station on San Salvador. It, if you look up at the map, we had gone to Andros in 1976 on a party scuba diving, supposedly geology field trip. And when we were leaving, we met a guy at the airport who said, hey, there's this new field station on San Salvador. You ought to go check it out. So Jim checked it out and he said, we're going. So the next year we went down, we started taking students down, and that started a whole new sequence of events. People wonder how I got an island. I've been to Bermuda, I knew they were cool, but Cave research now became island karst research, which sounds really impressive or just, you know, obscure. Either way, you're going to win. Because they don't know what you do, then 
you, you can fool people like that. So we went down and we started doing stuff. We did the Friends of Cars down there. There's Ping Chow and John Blair in a cave in White House, a cave in 1977. And there's Joe with my Syracuse University varsity shirt on and all that good stuff. And so we played around a lot of stuff. Now, uh, if you're doing water work in the islands, it's nice because it's warm and all that sort of stuff. And here in Bermuda, in Church Cave, Art Palmer's got a uh, nice picture he took. And when all the flash bulbs went off, I'd startled me so much, I flipped out of the inner tube. And, and of course, there's no way to take a picture of that because you've got to reload the flash tube. But this is at the Castle Harbor Golf Course. And the next cave we were in, we went down, and all these golf balls in there. And, and, and Hart says, well, where are these golf balls from? I said, oh, they've probably been hit in the entrance and bounced down here. And Peg goes, oh, no, they just probably threw them away. She hadn't gotten done saying that. We heard this <laughs> And a golf ball lands at our feet. So <laughs> we answered that question. And then, uh, you know, you can go diving in blue holes. And for those of you who heard Bill Steele's talk yesterday, he talked about the diver who did the first dive in the upstream sump of of uh, Honey Creek. That's John Schwain. It's John Schwain in that picture right there with his side mounts, 1986, going out to dive Watling's Blue Hole. But we decided that sort of work was dangerous. It'd be a lot better to use a submarine. So we uh, had an option to use the Johnson Sea Link submarine. This is from the Harbor Branch Foundation on the east side of Florida. And they would come out to San Salvador and use the field station as their land base of operations and in return for the use of those facilities they would allow the field station to award dives to some of the faculty who came down and so we wrote up a quick proposal and got approved and so we came down to look for caves on the vertical wall of San Salvador and you can see in the lower left picture that's a freeze frame, frame from a video uh, they were there 125 meters down 105 meters down and for those of you who know your Pleistocene sea level curves that's Two of the, uh, each of those is the low stands in the last four uh, glaciations. But you know, we use a Johnson ceiling. It had this grab, you can see that big, big crane at the top. It was the first submersible, research submersible, to use the pick drop technique. And after they lost the Alvin, because it got swamped during the normal load unload procedure from the Zodiac, the Alvin now launches the same way. So it was already ahead of the time. But we used that submarine because the one we wanted, the one that had real cave experience, was on contract elsewhere. So, I mean, I mean, look, he's going right in the cave, no fear, no problems, and we, but you know, couldn't get it. So, that time we uh, decided to start a family. Holy smokes, we've been married 12 years, and now we're going to do this. And so we had a firstborn son named Eric. Wow, that's interesting. It uh, went so well, we decided to have one more. You know, one more. Oops. <laughs> so, uh, Uncle, you know, that summer, that summer, Joan had been with me in Norway doing field work, five months pregnant. She was gigantic. I thought, Jesus, doctor said it's going to be a 10 pound baby. And she's going through these caves, and there, we had two Yugoslav scientists with us who thought that when a woman got pregnant, you locked her in the bedroom for nine months. And she's down here in the cave, and they didn't want to go through this low crawl in Harmanesic Grotta. It was a, has these big series of phreatic loops, and the lower elbows they had to dig out. So you're going through there, and Joan just flops on her back, pushes the belly down, wiggles through, and those guys had to follow, and they were really pissed. Later, I took these two to that cave and said, you've been here before. Anyhow, so she goes in the labor room, we go to the hospital, and we go into the labor room, and they attach the fetal monitor, all that sort of stuff, and the doctor struts in with his three-piece suit, says, well, in about an hour, we'll go down and, uh, you know, put our scrubs on. And the nurse bends over and takes a look and says, my God, doctor, it's crowned. So, ooh, boom, on the gurney, roar down to the birthing chair, slap Rennet, a couple pushes, and boing, out comes a skin. He's 19 inches long and he weighs five pounds. And I say, Doc, you said a 10 pound baby. What's up? Oh, there's no problem, no problem at all. Turns to the nurse and says, call the pediatrician. It's an emergency. I'm going, what? And so he's got the kid who 
being a boy, he's gotten the boy's name, I still got the girl's name, got the boy's name, and he's aspirating the mucus on the Billy Rubin lights and looking at, looks over at Joan, looks at the kid, looks over at Joan, tells the remaining nurse, because there's no problem, to come over here and watch the kid, and goes over to Joan and goes, oh my God, push now, hard as you can. Out comes another kid, 19 inches long and five pounds, because he'd been sharing lunch for nine months. Joan goes, I don't fucking believe it. <laughs> the doctor rotates the newborn around to look at him, and the newborn promptly defecates that black green stuff newborns have, my Cody, all over his three piece suits, because we don't have our scrubs on. He goes, oh shit. And he told Joan she shouldn't talk that way when she made her comment. Joan says, Doc, you shouldn't talk that way. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> It's like, well, well, it's a boy. I've used up the boy's name. We have a girl's name, but I don't think I, Johnny Cash's boy name suit just kept running through my head. So I said, Joan, what are you gonna name this kid? And she goes, I've done all the work tonight. It's your job. <laughs> so that's how Leif and Lars got their name. But I told a joke many years later to the boys about this young Indian boy who asks his father how his brother and sister got the name. Many of you may know it, and I won't say it here, but every once in a while, Lars will sign a text, two dogs. <laughs> uh, you can see who will ask who knows the joke. All right. Well, in 19 months, I went from two incomes and two mouths to feed to one income and five mouths to feed. What am I gonna do? Well, it's time for a better paying job. So I looked down and uh, Mississippi State's looking for an apartment head. I said, what the heck, I apply. Uh, and they hired me. <laughs> My mother told me, well, that's interesting. You're gonna go from Kentucky to Mississippi. I said, yeah, mom. He said, I'm gonna raise the IQ of both states. But the big thing about going to Mississippi State is I got grad students. Now, they're only master's students. We didn't get a PhD until 27. But it's the last legalized form of indentured servitude. You can work and squeeze and grind those people. It's wonderful. So because of that, let's see, I had 62 grad students. I got 60 of them graduated. The two that didn't graduate had done enough to get publications out of the research. So that was good fun. Boy, they really increase your reach when you got slave labor, and it's much better than using your kids. So, Korea's gone, taken off, I got uh, the honorary member award, and if you do research on caves, and all you cavers know this, you've had to go back and resurvey a cave because somebody lost the notes. Publishing what you know is important, so I've worked hard to get the ideas out from glaciation and cars and uh, coastal landforms and cars, uh, coastal highland stuff out and about into the, the real world. But it, caving's a team sport. And I had the best teammate ever. We have gone all over the world, mostly to islands, and had a wonderful time. Just Fice Island, the Kingdom of Yap, Barbados, the Marianas, all over the place. It's really been a good time. And we could say to that, with apologies to Samuel Coldridge, we've been upward to a sunlit sea. That's good. You guys don't know the ancient mariner? No. Okay. There'll be a quiz later, no extra credit. So, well, none of this would have been accomplished without the National Geological Society. I mean, and the members and everybody there. Think what it does. Exploration and surveying, conservation, cave science, and perhaps best of all, parties. <laughs> Tonight's the terminal siphons. I've got a date. If some of you guys don't have a date, I think Joan's available. Okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, I think we all know uh, cavers can be very excitable, especially when you lock the cave gate on them. This is Stein Eric Lorentzen and Lars Hulet in Arctic Norway. Uh, he's a, a good caver, good scientist. I always thought of him as a European art palmer. And of course, cavers are pretty crazy. You dug that bill? You notice how Hazel's carefully hidden where you can't see her. All you see is her arm pointing up. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. 
So, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. In the 1981 Congress, Art and Peg said, hey, anybody want to do a through trip down the Floyd Collins Crystal Cave entrance and come out the Austin entrance into the side of the mountain? I said, well, sure, I'm on. And we took Mike, the late Mike Queen and Pete Smart and Ben Lyon, who was uh, England's answer to Bob and Bob. And we go in and we were, we're moving along. We go down through the corkscrew and all the hard stuff into the, you know, lost paradise, all that stuff. We get to Bogarda's Waterfall Trail. And we're crawling along. All of a sudden we stop. I hear Art and Peg up in front, sort of, not arguing, but as close as I've ever heard them to arguing. And Mike, who's in front of me, turns and goes, do you hear that? Do you know what it means? I said, what does it mean? He says, Art and Peg are arguing about which way to go, which means we're going to die. <laughs> so eventually we go on through and we pop out into this little pit light thing on the wall and we drop down. I turn around and look around and I said, well, we're in Black Onyx Pit. And Peg goes, what? You've never been here. I said, no, but I saw the picture in Caves Beyond. This is Black Onyx Pit. You even got the wire coming out and going down just like it has in the picture. And so from there we got out. And then, Caving's an adventure, as we all know, and if you've been going to international exploration or yesterday U.S. exploration, you realize there's some real big adventures going on. I keep looking at that stuff saying, not me. But we do find interesting things like uh, we stumbled across here on the right Amelia Earhart. Well, anyhow. So just sort of how I got to where I got and what influenced me to get here, I didn't do it alone. That really helped. Uh, you know, you can't control the external decisions, but you can sort of work around them. You can make good internal decisions. Be prepared and what you want, how to get there, and you can end up in Salt Pond Cave, as we did, having a really good time on an island where they make their own rum. And then just one last little rule is uh, my fish to pond ratio which means if you make the pond really small, you're a hell of a big fish, okay? So that's New York, you gotta love the little ones. That, that, that really worked for me. And finally, to conclude, I wanna dedicate this luminary to Art and Peg Palmer, uh, who are absolutely wonderful cavers and cave scientists, but uh, they're even better people, just really superb. Uh, individuals, and I really appreciate Art and Peg all you did for me and Joan over the years. They're the, they're the godparents of my oldest boy. No questions. No questions. Good. Oh. Tell me about some of your gratitude. Oh yeah. Yeah, Nicole's in here. Yeah, you now work for Cumberland Caverns, is that correct? She's one of my grad students. Patricia Nancy Cambesis was one of my first and only PhD students. You only got a PhD program at the very end, just before I retired. They would get four of them out. Patty was one, Eric Larson, some of you may know was another, John Summerall, and Athena uh, Owen. So that was, uh, was good fun. Grad students are great. You're like kids, but you get rid of them. They don't come back and live in your basement. Which is good, because I'm on a slab. Anything else? Anything else? Yeah, Brad. Oh, Brad. Brad and I first came together in 1972 with Carl Kingsley. Right, Brad? Somewhere there, about. Yeah. I was wondering, how come you did all that work in the studio? Oh, that's a real specific site-specific question. I'll answer that afterwards, because it wouldn't mean anything to anybody else. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, thanks, folks. We got one question back here. Whoa. Thank you. Where is it? Yeah. What's your most famous or, or most liked project that you worked on over the years? Oh, wow. Oh, I like them all equally. Bullshit. Okay. Um, boy, that's really hard. Um, 
the, qu the question is, what cave or cave project or research I worked on was my most favorite? Man, the two months we spent in New Zealand, month on North Island, month on South Island, we walked every coastal outcrop of limestone in the country and mapped caves and wrote up a paper and just to be in New Zealand. You know, you go to Australia and it says scenic overlook, 15 minutes. And if you stroll slowly, you can make it in 10. You go to New Zealand and it says scenic overlook, 15 minutes. If you run like hell, you'll make it in 20. It's just a different philosophy in the people. The landscape's tremendous. Yeah, that'd be a place I'd go at. Well, thank you very much, John. Great lecture.